Welcome to this edition of Diligence Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm TK Kerstetter and I'll be your host for today's show. Today we're going to be talking about audit committees and handle audit committee creep. And we'll find out exactly what that means here in a second. But please welcome my guest, Margaret Whalen, who's a board member with Porch.com and also PropTech Investment Corp. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you, TK. Good to see you again today. Yes, good to see you. So, you know, I thought you'd be a great guest for this because the various boards that you've served on, you always seem to end up in the on the audit committee. And in fact, on one of your two today, you serve as the chair of the audit committee. So, um, and it's my experience that whenever a board um, ends up finding a um, risk or whatever that it needs to oversee, it always seems in many companies to migrate to the audit committee. And now that we have cyber risk and we have ESG risk, geopolitical risk, human capital risk, I mean, it starts to raise some question of whether all those risks belong to the audit committee. Yet, in many of the charters that exist today for the audit committee, it says that they are responsible for risk. And the New York Stock Exchange says that in their uh, regular listing requirements on that. But the practical side is, you know, I don't think anybody was anticipating the level of risks that exist today. And that's what gives the name of audit creep is these uh, new responsibilities or oversight duties come creeping into the audit committee. And the next thing you know, the agendas are packed. And uh, one may argue that there's not the quality of time that's necessary to get to the core responsibilities of the audit uh, committee. So my question to you is, what's your experience with this audit creep? And how can somebody sort of look at their charter or look at their structure and say, okay, this is what makes sense, or this is where we might need, you know, to move things to other committees. Mm -hmm. um, well, as you said, TK, I've been on corporate boards for about a decade now. I've never managed to evade being on the audit committee off these boards. And twice recently in the last couple of years, I've actually been audit chair. Uh, I think it's, a couple of things. You're absolutely right about the scope creep, but we're in a world where a lot of things are changing very quickly and the rate of change can potentially increase the rate of risk if you're not on top of it. So I guess I see uh, three ways to uh, offset the risk. One is with a strong audit committee. One is with a strong external auditor, but most importantly, it's a very strong finance committee at the company level and that they would have the experience that they need. They would be anticipating the growth they were going to have, the direction of that growth, and really bringing um, material concerns to the board or the board helping them to identify and prioritize the concerns versus trying to boil the ocean. Because I think um, there's definitely creep happening. A lot of boards are small. The, the audit committees are fully engaged, but we just don't have all of the uh, resources that we need. And so several of those risks that you identify, cyber, for example, often it makes sense for the executive team to identify an expert on cyber and bring that expert in as an advisor to the company to figure out the solution or the to the bottleneck, whatever the challenge the company might be having. And secondly, not just to um, to anticipate the risk that's there, but also ensure to ensure the solution is uh, is put in um, into uh, working order quickly and responsibly. Because I've I've been on audit committees where a lot of money is spent identifying potential IT risks, cyber risks, and there's this great solution. And then six months later, you have a hack and you think, well, how do we have it? We paid all that money. Well, actually, the management team didn't uh, install it correctly. <laughs> so there's only so much the board, I guess, can do or the audit committee of the board. So I really lean happily on the finance team and their expertise and giving them the budget that they need to anticipate any changes or risks that might be there. 
I would say that the um, the other thing with the the risk of creep is just to say no as an audit committee. I understand there's an SEC charter, but sometimes it's saying no to it to an M and A or to a growth strategy outside of what the company is already addressing. In particular, if there are different accounting standards, if it's in a different part of the world, different currency, different risks that you're going to bring about, say no now so you don't have the risk or say or defer it, say no for now until you the team, again going back to the finance team, has correct correctly identified and anticipate the risk and how they're going to offset that. Your point's very well taken. I especially f- feel sorry for those audit committees that are dealing with uh, the ESG risk right now because everybody's grappling to get their arms around the metrics or the disclosures or whatever it might be to have done. And yet um, here, you know, sometimes by charter, you know, that ends up in the audit committee and, you know, there's the, there's social aspects of that, which is pretty far, pretty far away from, you know, financial reporting and whatever. But nonetheless, it seems that the committee has such a good process that things still end up in the audit committee. Well, maybe the process needs to not be so good, right? The part of the process <laughs> needs to be to say no. I mean, ESG is such a black hole. It's so important. We're also focused on it, but how do we get it right? I'll tell you another one is DNI. You know, diversity and inclusion is so important. It's been accelerated over the last 12, 18 months with all of the social unrest that has brought about very positive action. But how do we ensure that in a hybrid work environment that working women, for example, or people of color minority have the same access to resources that they would have in the office to support, to Wi-Fi, to heat, to, you know, there, there are a lot of variables that it's hard to um, understand and therefore it's hard to implement. So data and access to data is always incredibly important. So that leads me to, at least the risk part of it leads me to my next question. And that is, um, we're seeing uh, more and more companies form risk committees, okay? Uh, obviously, that was mandated in Sarbanes-Oxley to financial institutions where they were required to do that. But I'm sorry, that was Dodd-Frank that it was uh, required to do that. And um, But more and more you're seeing because of this plethora of risks that outside of financial reporting or financial risks, you see risk committees and the risk committees you know, are dealing with many of those topics that we've just talked about in addition to whether that's geopolitical, human capital, whatever it might be. Um, but, uh, and I've always recommended when I've been asked about this that a good way to do that to make sure that all the committees are communicating is to make sure that the audit chair, comp chair and non-gov chair is also on the risk committee that way there's no risk left un, sort of uncommunicated on that side. But um, so as somebody that's been associated with audit committees, how do you feel about the concept of non-financial companies forming risk committees? You know, it's interesting you reference Todd Frank, because I think that over the course of my career, nearly 30 years in investment banking, working with public companies, what I found is with Sarbanes-Oxley, the nature of boards changed so much towards uh, cookie cutter committee and checking the box, meeting with all the different external advisors quarterly versus really thinking about strategy. So the potential of having another fourth committee on top of that, for me, is just not that attractive because it would take away from the time that you can really think the exciting stuff with the business. Where is the business going? What are we doing well? What could we improve upon? And I think if you have too many committees, you spend too much time um, focusing on that, which is not to say that the identifying and anticipating risk is not critical, it is. I love your idea of having all the committee chairs on a committee, but going back to uh, to what I was saying earlier, TK, in my mind, if you have a really strong finance committee at the company level and a very so- strong general counsel and investor relations and all of the ways that things can go wrong, we haven't uh, mentioned the activism, you know, so many activists trying to nudge their way into the boardroom these days and, and being and doing so successfully most of the time. Um, all of the ways that the company, the leadership can make sure that the promises they're making 
to their stakeholders or promises that they can keep because it's it's the, what gets lost in the middle there that creates risk in my mind. And if you can put more of it on the executive team and then the board has oversight versus day-to-day responsibility, I think that's important. The other thing with so many of these risk factors is that you don't necessarily need a full-time committee or executive for whichever risk you're trying to identify. Often there are phenomenal resources and executives that are very thoughtful and can zoom in as you need them and then zoom out again. And in my mind, that can be even more valuable than having someone on the executive team who may have a a skill set or resources that are getting stale at some point. Well, and and I I think you just presented the argument that's pretty much uh, been the case of how many people do you need and how uh, distracting does it get from some core topics when you create new committees? At the same time, I think that, and right, rightfully so, I think some companies are recognizing that there's pieces of their business that they have to monitor um, that is so important to their success that it takes a board committee for that type of oversight. And to me, I know for a fact that um the b- chairs of committees are really the individuals that take the heavy weight on their shoulders and to take a topic that's critical to the company and not have a chair responsible for it in other words giving it time in between meetings and whatever i can see why that would be a problem and it's one of the reasons um Margaret, that I think so much thought has to be given when you bring a new director on, on who can be your board, you know, your committee chairs, because the responsibility in many ways, you're almost as good as your committee chairs in some ways because of the responsibility that they take. So I I have a lot of respect for anybody that's a committee chair. The responsibility they take on, the level of engagement. It's very hard to find that balance because management team and good boards are separate, right? The the boards are there to answer questions and help the management team go in the right direction, but not to overstep too much. So it's definitely hard to find that balance. Well, listen, um, your comments are always uh, wise and well taken. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us today. This is a topic that I'm sure is going to be debated as we look and see how boards evolve in the future to all the changes that have happened. This year has certainly tested us all. Um, So, but thank you again for taking the time to join us. It's my pleasure. And I hope next time I see you, it'll be in person. Me too. So, yep, that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at a critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then.